Hello. In today's lecture, we're going to be looking at a very important topic with regards to vector spaces and linear algebra in general, and that is the idea of a linear map. So a linear map, so a linear map, or a linear transformation, Okay, so you might uh, you might see either of those terms is a map between vector spaces that satisfies two important conditions. So um, in general, we can write a linear map, let's say T, as a map between vector spaces, let's say V and W, and it satisfies two conditions. So the first condition that it satisfies is that if we have T being our linear map acting on vectors V and U, okay, that is from the vector space V, then this must be equal to T of V plus T of U. So we can see that this addition in the on the left hand side, this addition here is between vectors in V. So the vector V and vector U are both from V. So that addition is vector addition on V. And then on the right hand side, this addition here is the vector addition on W, because T of V and T of U are both elements in W. Okay, so that is the first condition. And the second condition is that T of lambda V is equal to lambda T of V. And uh, similar to what we had before, the scalar multiplication on the left-hand side is the scalar multiplication on V, but on the right-hand side, we see that the scalar multiplication here is the scalar multiplication on W. So we see that in either case, the operations on the first vector space uh, before we do the, um, the mapping is converted into operations on the second vector space after the mapping. So we say that these two operations are preserved by the linear map. So these two operations and then which form the vector space structure. So remember, uh, before we added those operations, the vector space was just a set. And then we added the operations and then it became a vector space. So uh, these operations give the vector space its mathematical structure. So these two operations, which form the vector space structure, are preserved. Bar the linear map. Okay, so that goes uh, with what I said earlier. The addition we had on V before the mapping becomes the addition um, on W after the mapping. Okay, so we see that this uh, map T uh, plays nicely with those two operations there. Okay, so when we are sp uh, specifically talking about vector spaces, uh, we call this property linearity. Okay, if we are dealing with a general mathematical structure that's not a vector space, um, maybe it's an algebra, maybe it's a group, and so on, uh, we call this a homomorphism. So that is the general name for it. Yeah, but you don't have to worry too much about that. Um, we're going to be dealing specifically with vector spaces, 
So we are going to refer to them as linear maps, but in general, we call this structure preserving map homomorphisms. So you might see that um, if you look at this online somewhere. So these structure preserving maps are called homomorphisms in general. Okay, so the vector space homomorphisms, those are just the linear maps. So vector space homomorphisms. We just call them linear maps. And we see that this linear describes the structure that we are preserving with the homomorphisms, uh, specifically the vector addition and the scalar multiplication. So together, this defines the idea of linear or linearity. Okay, so um, from a couple of lectures ago, I was talking about um, linear, linear span, linear vector spaces, linear subspaces. Um, this is where it comes from, this property of the uh, linear map, okay, preserving the linear structure. Okay, so this is very important here. Okay, so in general, vector space homomorphisms, um, but then we just call them linear maps. Okay, so let's have a look at um, some examples of this. So, example, uh, if we have some linear map T, let's say that goes from V to V, and it takes a vector V and sends it to uh, some multiple of V, so let's say 2V, for example, that's a linear map. So just scaling vectors, uh, that is a linear map. And we can see that this is a linear map uh, by just checking these properties here. So checking this. So checking uh, that this is linear. Okay, so first of all, if we have T acting on uh, V plus W, what do we get? So T acting on V plus W, this is going to be two times V plus W, okay, because it's just a simple scaling. Uh, but then we can distribute this two inside because of our uh, vector scalar multiplication rules. Remember the distributivity. <clears throat> So this is two times V plus two times W, but two times V, that's the same as T acting on V. So that's just T of V and two times W, that's just T acting on W. Yeah, so we see we get this uh, separation here, which is that condition number one. Uh, what happens if we have a scalar multiple? So T, uh, let's say, Lambda V, okay, Lambda is some arbitrary scaling. So this is going to be two times Lambda times V. Okay, but remember we have associativity here. So the two and the Lambda, uh, we can shift the brackets around. So we can have uh, two times Lambda times V. And then because we're dealing with complex numbers, those are uh, commutative, so we can swap this around. So we can have lambda times two times V. And then again, with associativity, we can put the brackets over there. Uh, two times V, but that's just our T acting on V. So this is going to be lambda T of V. And so we see that this lambda comes out. Yeah, so that's because of the associativity and commutivity um, properties there. Okay, so this means that scaling a vector, if we 
prescribe that as a map uh, that is a linear operation. It's a very simple linear operation, uh, but this gets the idea across of um, how we check linearity. Okay, before we continue, um, I just want to introduce a slight change in notation. So usually with maps, like f of x, we have f brackets x, like we have here with t open bracket v uh, for the vector. Uh, for quantum mechanics, which we're going to be getting into later on, we're just going to be dropping those brackets. Okay, and then instead of calling them linear maps, we're going to be calling them linear operators or just operators. Okay, and so we write uh, the following. So notation, if we have T, which is a map, so we usually write like this, uh, we drop the brackets and we just write T V like so. Okay, so we will see later on, once we do representations of these linear maps, uh, that this closely resembles the matrix multiplication. Okay, so that's a bit of a spoiler for what we're going to get to, but we'll see that this T is a, is a map, but for finite vector spaces, we can represent them as matrices. So we can imagine this T as a map, or we can imagine it as a matrix, and this V here, that's a vector space element, a vector, we can also imagine it as a uh, column vector from C n. Okay, but we will uh, we will get to that. Okay, so let's see how these linear maps work when we choose a particular basis. Okay, so given a finite vector space, we can pick a basis for it. So given a finite dimensional vector space. V, we can choose a basis. Basis V, okay. and I emphasize choose here because there's not a unique basis Choosing a basis, that is up to you. And if you look at those uh, homework problems that are posted, you will see that we can go from one basis to another because any element in a basis is just an element from the vector space. So we can write it as a, as a linear combination from another basis. Okay, because if you've got two bases for a vector space, you can always write the one element um, in terms of the other one. Okay, but here we're working with one basis uh, B. So let's say this basis is given by the elements one up to N. Again, this one up to N, those are just labels. Uh, there's no particular order for these vectors. Uh, we just treat those numbers as labels. Okay, so given this basis, we can write any vector in V as a linear combination of these basis vectors. So any vector V, we can write as alpha 1 times 1 plus dot 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 plus alpha n times n. And if we're dealing with a complex vector space, uh, which we are usually going to work with, these alpha r's are complex numbers. Okay, so we've got our vector V expressed in terms of basis elements. Now we want to know what happens if we apply a linear map T. So let's say we've got a linear map T from the vector space uh, we're working with going into another vector space W. Okay, so we can apply T to this vector. So T on this vector is going to be t. Um, and now I'm just going to put the brackets just to show that the linear combination um, is all included. So t acting on alpha 1, 1, plus alpha 2, 2, plus dot, 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 plus alpha n, n. 
now we know that t is linear okay, that emphasize that um just a note on that if you want to uh, explicitly show that t is linear we can put a little squiggle over the line uh, that right arrow okay and then that emphasizes that it's linear okay so either you can explicitly say t is linear or you can put the little squiggle that means the same thing okay so we know t is linear which means these uh expansion coefficients can be taken out because of property number two um, over there and we can also separate it over the different um, additions from property number one. So let's do that. So we can write this as alpha one, T acting on one, plus alpha two, two, T acting on two, plus dot, 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 plus alpha N, T acting on N. Okay. So just to note, these T acting on one, T acting on two, all the way to T acting on N, those are elements of W, because after we take the mapping, we end up in W. So um, all of these are elements of W. Now, what we can do is choose a basis for W. Okay, so let's do that. Uh, so we are, already have B as a basis for V. So let's choose choose a basis. Let's say B prime. And this is going to be one prime up to N prime as a basis. Oh, sorry, I already said that. So choose a basis. Uh, one prom up to n prom for w. Okay. Now that we have a basis for w, we can represent these vectors t1 up to tn as linear combinations of vectors from b prom. Okay, because they're from w, we can expand them in the b prom basis. So let's do that. So this is equal to alpha one, and then T of one, we can express in terms of um, these elements here. So we can write that as, um, we can write that as beta one, one prom plus beta two, two prom plus dot, 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 plus beta n, n, Prom. Okay, so that is expressing uh, T acting on one in terms of the basis on W. Okay, so that's just for T1. We can do the same thing for T2. So this is going to be plus alpha 2. And we're going to have a similar expansion with different expansion coefficients. So they won't be betas. Uh, they will be something like uh, gamma one <clears throat> one prom up to gamma n n prom and so on and then we can do the same thing for alpha three similar thing there with different expansion coefficients so what we have done is we have taken t acting on v okay we have written the input v um, expanded out using a given basis, so B. Then we took the result and we have expanded it out in a basis for W. And what we end up with are all of these expansion coefficients. Okay, so how many do we have? Well, if um, V has dimension um, N and W has dimension M, okay, so um, let's say instead of going up to n, let's say that's m. Okay, just to make it clearer. So we have up to m there. Um, and then that's up to m. That's up to m. So we end up with n times m uh, expansion coefficients here, or, or numbers that describe the transformation. So choosing b as a basis for V 
and choosing B prom as a basis for W gives us, uh, we had N of those alphas, M of the, um, the other expansion coefficients. So we end up with N by M many numbers that describe the transformation or the mapping. Okay, so we've got all of these expansion coefficients here, um, and they describe the mapping from uh, V to W. Now, you may not see this immediately, but this looks very similar to the linear equations that you did last year. Okay, so if you have a set of linear equations like this, we can write the coefficients in the form of a matrix. Okay, and then that describes um, all the coefficients of those linear equations. So we can do a similar thing here. We're going to take all of these coefficients and organize them into a matrix. Okay, so we take all of these coefficients and organize organize them into a matrix of numbers. Okay, so for now, just imagine this matrix as an organization scheme. Okay, so we're not doing any matrix multiplication yet. Uh, all we're doing is we're taking these expansion coefficients here and we're organizing them into a matrix, okay, just so that it looks nice. But we will see that this specific organization that we're going to do uh, makes it very easy to apply this transformation as matrix multiplication. Okay, so let's say um, all these coefficients here, I'm going to organize them into a matrix. Uh, let's call it A. Okay, and the way I'm going to do that is by looking at the rows and columns uh, formed by this multiplication. So we've got here, um, like this bit here, uh, this over here. Uh, let me choose a different color. Uh, it's not too clear. Okay, but we see that we have uh, rows and columns of values. So we've got alpha one, alpha two, alpha three going down, and then we've got um, these other values going as the columns. So we're going to take it row and column wise, um, and then just sort them in the matrix. So um, if we do that, we're going to end up with something like A11 going down to A um, M1. Okay, and then going across, we have up to A uh, 1N, so row one and then the nth column. And then we can go A M N. Okay, so this is just a way of organizing um, these values that we have here. Okay, so maybe to better illustrate it, I uh, uh, can leave it as a homework exercise. If we have a vector space that's two-dimensional going to a vector space that's three-dimensional, uh, given uh, a two-element basis for the one, a three-element basis for the other, uh, you can do that explicitly to see what all the coefficients will be. Um, and then you will see uh, why this matrix looks the way it is. Okay, uh, but I will leave that as a, as a homework exercise. For now, we can just see this as a neat way of organizing all of these values that we have over here. Okay, so now that they're organized, we'll see why this is so uh, useful. So. Uh, if we go back to uh, V that we had here, remember we took V and we expanded it out in the this one to N basis, and we got coefficients alpha one to alpha N. So what we can do is take these alpha one to alpha N and write them as a column vector. Okay, again, it's just a way of representing this information. 
because we've already chosen a basis. So this alpha one to alpha n is unique and we can just write it as a column vector okay, to keep track of those values. Okay, so we can write V as a column vector of alpha one down to alpha n. Okay, so this is a column vector representation of our vector element. Okay, so it's just a way of organizing um, those values. So given a basis, we can organize the expansion coefficients in this uh, column vector. Okay, and again, that's just a way of organizing. But we will see now that if we take this matrix that we've got above here and we multiply it by this column vector, that has the same action of uh, what we have here. That will have the same action as mapping via T. Okay, so Uh, matrix multiplying a uh, or matrix multiplying V and A has the same effect as mapping via T. In other words, if we take A and we multiply it by V, we end up with this vector formed by um, what we did here. So if we look over here, we've got this element here, this one, two, and up to M. Okay, if we add all of the coefficients up so that we write this as a single linear combination, yeah, so all the coefficients of the one prime vector, we add all of those together. All of the coefficients for the two prime vector, we add all of that up so that we end up with a single linear combination. We will see that the coefficients of that linear combination are the coefficients of the resulting vector of A times V. So the coefficients... of the vector T acting on V. Okay, so expanded in the B prime basis um, are stored in the um, elements of the column vector of the matrix A times the column vector V. Okay, so we see that providing a basis on the domain of the map and the target of the map allows us to represent the vectors as well as the linear map in terms of column vectors and matrices. Okay, so choosing a basis for V and a basis for W allows us to represent the vectors as column vectors that you looked at last year. Yep. So remember those column vectors just organized the expansion coefficients. Yep. But it is a representation of the vector because it holds the same information as the original vector. Yep. It's just a different way of viewing it. So it allows us to represent the vectors as column vectors and linear maps as matrices.
Okay, so this is a, a very powerful tool that we can use for calculations. So given abstract vector spaces and abstract maps, we can construct concrete representations that we can do calculations with. So given abstract vector spaces and abstract maps, we can use these uh, column vectors and matrices We can use these column vectors and matrices to do calculations. Okay, because we have um, actual numbers to work with once we have these column vectors and matrices. Okay, and altogether, this is called representations um, of the vector spaces and the maps. So in summary, we have this vector space V. Once we choose a basis, we can, instead of using V, uh, we can use Rn, that is the set of column vectors um, of length N. Instead of W, we can use Rm. Okay, so the V is n-dimensional, W is m-dimensional, and then the set of linear maps, uh, from V to W, uh, that's given by this notation. So that is the set of linear maps from V to W. Instead of looking at that abstract set, we can look at the set of matrices. So let's call that M. Okay. And then the matrices uh, will be um, M by N. Okay, so M rows for, for, the, for the W and N columns that that corresponds to the V. Okay, and then this, um, on the, on the right-hand side here, this is our concrete representations. Sorry, concrete representations. Okay, and we get these concrete representations by choosing a basis on V and a basis on W. Okay, so I will be leaving some uh, homework problems, looking at this. So you're going to be taking abstract vector spaces, uh, choosing a basis on each, and then looking at the linear maps uh, between them. Okay, uh, so those, uh, those problems will be for homework. Um, you will get the solutions later on. Okay, but let's have a look at some examples for now. Okay, so examples. Okay, so let's say we have the linear map uh, T. It's going from R2 as a vector space into R3. Okay, so from uh, the set of XY pairs into the set of XYZ uh, triples. Okay, so how does this map work? So T um, acting on some XY here. This is going to be equal to uh, Y comma X plus two Y comma um, X plus Y. Okay, so that is a, uh, a map. So for homework, uh, you're going to be checking that this is indeed a linear map. Okay, so. Um, I'll leave that for you to, to check. Uh, what we're going to be doing is finding the matrix representation of this linear map. Okay, so the target, uh, sorry, the domain and the target are already of the form Rn and Rm. Okay, so that's fine. However, this linear map, uh, this is fine the way it's defined, but we know that since it's a linear map, there should be a matrix representation. Uh, we're going to find that. Okay, so we need to find the matrix representation uh, 
of t. Because currently t is just prescribed as a map, we would like to find the matrix form of it. Okay. Um, as we said at the beginning, uh, since t is linear to prescribe t, we only need to show what t does to a basis. Okay. That was the whole um, beginning of this, is we found a basis for v, basis for w, and from that we could um, work out what t does. So a uh, basis for R2, what we, what we can choose is a very simple basis. Uh, we can pick one zero and zero one. Okay, we usually refer to that as the standard basis. Okay, of course, you're free to choose another basis, but then you're going to get a different matrix. Okay. So in general, when we're working with R to the N or C to the N, uh, we like to work with the standard basis, okay? Because it's very uh, simple looking. It's just one, zero, zero, one for R2. Um, and also it is an orthonormal basis. So um, we know that that is nice to work with from our work on inner product spaces. Okay, so we've got the basis for the domain, a basis for the target. Uh, we're just going to again choose the standard basis, but now it looks like this. Okay. So what does T do to these basis elements of the domain? <clears throat> so T acting on one zero, what do we get? X is going to be one and Y is going to be zero. So we're gonna end up with zero, one, and one. Okay, that's the, the outputs of uh, T acting on one zero. Uh, what about the other basis element? T acting on zero one is equal to, okay, so now X is zero, Y is one. So we get one, two, and one. Like so. Okay, so we've got that, the outputs of this. How do we construct A from this? Well, if we know the outputs, uh, like we have here, A is very easy to construct. It's just that we take the output vectors here um, for the first basis vector, and we write it as a column for A. So the first one, we write as the first column. And the second one we write as the second column. And this gives us the matrix representation of T. So this is the matrix representation of T. Okay, so this was um, a bit odd. We're just taking the, the vectors and putting them as columns. How do we know that this works? Well, let's take this matrix, multiply it by an arbitrary x, y column vector, and see if we get our desired result. So t acting on x, y should be equivalent to a acting on x, y as a column vector. We should be getting equivalent results from that. So let's have a look. So A is given by 0, 1, 1, 1, 2, 1. And then this is being multiplied by X, Y. Okay, so what is this? Okay, so 0, 1 times X, Y, that's going to be Y. 1, 2 times X, Y, that's going to be X plus 2, Y. And 1, 1 times X, Y, that's going to be X plus Y. And if we look at the each element, if we want to write it as a tuple, we can take the first element y, the second one x plus 2y, um, and the last one x plus y. Sorry, that's a plus there. Um, yeah, so we just took from a column vector, we wrote it as a three tuple. Uh, let's see if that matches up. So we have y, x plus 2y, x plus y. We have y x plus 2y, x plus y. So yes, this matrix does exactly the same, uh, the exactly the same thing as our linear map, T 
Okay, so they are equivalent. So that's perfectly fine. Okay, so that is the general method for finding the matrix representation of a linear map. So we know that it's linear, which means we only need to know how it acts on a basis. So we have T acting on a first basis vector, T acting on the second basis vector. We take the results. We <clears throat> sorry, we put those as the column vectors in our matrix representation. And that gives us the matrix representation um, of, of the linear map. Okay, so there are a few more exercises um, in the notes. So please have a look at those. Okay, so that is looking at finding matrix representations using the standard basis, as we did here. Um, and there's another exercise where we use a different basis. Okay, and we still get a matrix representation, uh, but it's different because we chose a different basis. Okay, so that is very important here with this representation. There is more than one way of representing the linear map. Okay, because it depends on the basis on the domain as well as the basis on the target. Okay, um, there are uh, several examples of linear maps that are um, used in physics. So those are uh, rotations. So rotations are acting on vectors. Those are linear maps. Uh, rotations, reflections, scalings, uh, shears, and so on, um, as well as projections. So all of those actions that we can do on vectors those are also linear maps. Yeah, and we're going to have a look at those um, in the tutorial. Okay, so we're going to be doing some programming where we implement these as matrices in the Python program. And then we can visualize what those matrices uh, or what those maps do to different vectors. Okay, uh, the last thing that we're going to be doing today is looking at <clears throat> given a particular basis uh, for the domain and the target, um, how do we find individual matrix elements? Okay, so here we constructed the full representation A, but maybe you only want to know a particular element. For example, uh, row one, column one, maybe you just want that. So instead of finding the complete matrix, there is a way of finding individual matrix elements. Okay, so, okay, next section here. Finding individual matrix elements of a linear map. So how do we do that? So let's say we had a standard basis uh, for a vector space. Uh, let's say it was three-dimensional. So we choose a basis uh, for V. And let's say it's given bar one, which is one, zero, zero. Two. This is zero, one, zero, and three. This is uh, zero, zero, one. So a standard basis for R3 or C3, yeah, something like that. Okay, so once we have this basis, how do we find uh, the individual matrix elements? So what we do is we take our uh, linear map T or the matrix representation of T, and we sandwich it between two of these vectors. So let's say we sandwich it between uh, one and two. Okay, so we construct, okay, or we calculate, okay, the, the following. So we have one um, as a bra, so we know how to do that given a, a vector 
we can use the dagger operation to convert it from a cat to a bra. So we can do that here. Then in the middle of the sandwich, we have our matrix or linear map, in this case, A. And then on the right, uh, let's say we do it with two, like that. So this sandwiching of our linear map between two of the basis elements. Okay, so this is in direct notation, but we have a concrete representation. So let's use that. So one as a bra is going to be one zero zero as a row vector, one zero zero. Then A, uh, we can write that as a, a three by three matrix. Okay, so I'm, I'm assuming that the uh, domain and the target are both three dimensional, but of course this works for um, other dimensions as well. Okay, so we have A11, A12, A13, um, A21, A22, A23, A31, A32, A33, in general, right? This is a general three by three matrix. Um, and then we have two as a kit, so that's a column vector. Um, and then we see here two is zero, one, zero. So let's put that down here. And let's calculate this. Okay, so this one, zero, zero, that can stay. And let's perform the matrix multiplication. So since it's a three by three matrix times a column vector, the result is gonna be a column vector. Okay, so let's multiply this out. First row times the column, that's gonna be A12. Uh, second row times the column is A22. Third row times the column is gonna be A32. Lastly, let's do this. Uh, the row times the column is gonna be A12. Now, okay, that's just an individual matrix element, which is exactly what we wanted. But notice on the left-hand side um, of our sandwich, we got one. That was our first uh, basis vector. And on the right-hand side of the sandwich, we got two. And then if we look on the, the right-hand side of this, we have the element A12. Okay, so, if we choose uh, specifically what the sandwich is gonna look like, we can identify the individual matrix elements. So in general, okay, so this was specifically sandwiching one and two. So in general, if we have I, the Rth basis vector with A and then J, this is going to give us a, R, J as the matrix element. Okay. Um, and of course, this is specifically with the, uh, with this chosen basis. If you chose a different basis, then this action would be different and we would get a different element. Okay, so, so choosing a different basis will give us different matrix elements. Um, and we saw that before when we had those uh, the numbers here. So let's go back here, um, over here. So all of these coefficients here, uh, those would be different if we chose a different basis. So of course, if we go back here, um, this matrix element, um, the ARJ, that will of course be different if we choose a different basis. Okay, so all of this depends on the basis that we choose. Okay, um, so this works for finite dimensional vector spaces because A can be represented, sorry, the, the linear map can be represented by a matrix. Um, and again, if it's finite dimensional, it's a finite matrix, uh, but this also works with other linear maps. So maybe the, uh, target and the domain are not finite dimensional. In those cases, we still call it matrix elements, even though it's not technically a finite matrix. Okay, but we still call it that because of this finite dimensional behavior. Okay, so that is how we find the matrix elements 
of a linear map. Okay, we do this uh, sandwiching over here. And we're going to be using this quite a lot when we cover quantum mechanics. Okay, so these vectors on either side, those are going to uh, become quantum states. Um, and then this element, so not the element, this um, linear map in the middle, those uh, that will be replaced with quantum operators. Okay, and then the sandwiching, we call that finding the expectation value. Yeah. Okay, so that's just a bit of uh, jargon that's going to come up later on. Okay, but for now, uh, this is just general vector spaces and linear maps. Okay, so that's it for today. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to email me. Um, I'm always available. Uh, I may not be able to answer right away, uh, but please just email when you have a question. Uh, or you can visit me in my office. The details are on the course page. Um, most of the time, I'm, I'm available there. Okay, but please do the homework problems. Uh, the solutions will be posted later on. Uh, but do try do try them before looking at the solution. Okay, and again, on Wednesday, we are going to be having the uh, tutorial. Uh, it will be in person in the physics lab. Okay, so I'll see you then.